all that, but still showing me what I want to see. Uh, looking at traditional versus mastery, this is just some information from my grade book. Um, I have given a lot more tests this year. So this is a comparison of 2009, 2010 midterms. Um, so my midterm last year, my average was a 76. It went up to a 78, which, which is not statistically significant, but, you know, it looks good. Just, <laughs> I write very difficult tests because I want them to know the material. Um, I also have give more frequent tests this year. So comparing last year to this year, there are some differences. So testing this year, most tests are down, you know, 3 to 5% or so. Uh, test five, I did not give a fifth chapter test last year because I lumped them into groups of two. Uh, but anyway, some things to consider. Last year, uh, my tests were not as difficult because they were not as in-depth on specific units. This year, I'm giving a test every three weeks or so, so I can ask very specific questions. I can get more depth of knowledge out of the kids. Another thing, last year, my tests were um, a lot shorter. Well, no, I don't know how to say this. Test length. Uh, tests this year are shorter. There are fewer points available, so the scores have dropped a little bit just because of the opportunity to earn points is not as high as it was last year. So percentages do drop, um, but again, it's not a statistically significant drop. The volume of material I'm asking them to know is much higher. The depth of knowledge is much higher. And last year, what I allowed them to do is I allowed them to do test corrections, and they could earn half credit back that they missed. So the, the, the grade change was much more dramatic than this year, where they just retake it and they get the highest grade they get. Um, so with this year, uh, let's see. So average for Chem D was an 83. Most of the students, the last time they took their test, they got in that B range, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm shooting for a B. Um, you know, and the multiple testing thing. So every time they take a test, they get a random one, so it's still reliable. There's no leakage of information. I can sit down next to them and say, right, you missed all these multiple choice questions based on writing your formulas. You need to go back and look at writing formulas. So I can still pinpoint what they're missing, and they can improve from there. And the, the great thing is highest grade sticks. So once they get above a 75, well, then they get a new unit. But after that, they still have the option, if they would like to improve their grade, I still give them that option. I'm not going to limit them to what they want to do. So if they want to go back and continue to fix mistakes, that's great, as long as you're staying on top of what you need to do. So it's extra work for them to keep taking it. Um, and again, I can talk about that later. Uh, let's see, connecting to depth of knowledge. This is something that Amy Hughes sent to me. So this, uh, this is you know, Bloom's taxonomy, going from remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. This is what we all saw in college. Adding it into the web-based learning now, OK, remembering, well, if I just bookmark something on my browser, right, that's easy. You know, but if they can get up into this creating, so filming, I, um, in the beginning of the year, they had to do a periodic table. There's a couple examples over there, but I gave them 25 serials, and they had to create a periodic table that arranged them horizontally, vertically, with numeric values, with a key, and they had to create a video that went with it. So these kids took everything they had learned from that chapter, put together a presentation, and created a film, and now they're on YouTube for other kids to watch. So they're building, again, into that higher order thinking, analyzing what they've learned, taking it, applying it, and then creating something new with it to get it published out. Oh, almost done. All right, adapting your class. Do not do this with every class. If I did this with every single class, I would have pulled my hair out and then not come to work ever again. Um, you need to pick one class or one section of a class to start this with. I did it with general chemistry this year. And that's all I focused on. AP Chem, I'm teaching exactly the same way I did last year. Um, the chemistry in the community, it's a new curriculum. I'm not doing anything new with that. They're still traditional. They come in, we take notes, we do labs, we do projects. You, know. you need to, to limit the amount that you can do because it is very time intensive. And that is if you switch completely. Let me, let me say that. This year, I came in expecting to take all of my general chemistry, move everything to podcasts, give them notes. It's very, very heavy for even one class. Do not do this with every class. Um, modify this to fit your style. I'm very loosey goosey. You know, I'm I'm cool with whatever. I want the kids to learn. If you are not that, um, you need to modify this to fit your style. There's no one way to do that. So if you want to just move your instruction to the web but keep your grading the same, that's fine. It still works. You just need to let the kids know what you're expecting. Uh, changing little by little, don't overwhelm students or yourself. So when general chemistry came in, I gave them the information, then we took the first unit slow. And then I sped up a little bit, and then we sped up, and now they're completely independent. Um, 
if you dive in head first at this point in the year, you're probably going to have an aneurysm. All right? You need to change a little bit at a time, starting with one unit maybe, starting with just a week, or taking, um, for English, like pick a short story and do it this way. Uh, Spanish languages, this is great, because you can record yourself speaking in that language and just do listening based on that. So being very strategic about what you pick to start with is very, very important. Uh, like I said, just pick one unit and grade on objectives. Uh, focus on the formative assessment for the grading. That's huge, right? Instead of saying, all right, homework is going to be a grade every single time, 30% in the book, bummer, you, you didn't do well. Just do the formative, right? So say for this week, I want you to speak to me using your regular verbs, and I want you to be able to conjugate in you know, this tense, whatever, and talk with kids and grade on what they can do, not on what they, not on what they turn in. Uh, let's see, have students write their own objectives. So after you do a unit, say, what are the big ideas we covered for this unit? So in science this week, we talked about volcanoes. Well, volcanoes uh, put out igneous rock. They are only found at tectonic plate boundaries. Uh, I know where tectonic plate boundaries are, or show me where tectonic plate boundaries are. So picking things, having students analyze what you did, go back and apply it, really helps them solidify it. I haven't, I haven't done this particularly myself, but this would be one I would focus more for like middle school or elementary as they're starting to build those cognitive thinking skills, you know, or freshmen, <laughs> as they're starting to build those skills up, right? This is something to help them self-reflect, guiding the self-reflection. Um, do a lesson on mastery, so kind of say to your kids, hey, we're going to do something new. Do it, and then uh, take the students' ideas. What do they see as mastery? See, I set the bar at 75%. Students might say, well, mastery is like 85%. Okay, see if you can do it. You know, challenge them to do it themselves. And then use their ideas for the next unit. So as you're building into something, say, next unit, we're going to be looking at this, this, and this. I want to grade on skills. All right, what skills should you have that will show me that you know these four, five, six things, whatever? Um, and then have them design it so they're still owning the material. And that way, every day they come in, they say, I know how to do that. And they go home to mom and dad and say, I know how to speak in French using the imperfect tense. All right? And mom and dad say, awesome. You know? And it's just, it's the reinforcement, the positive reinforcement. Uh, and then just be creative. Do whatever you want. <laughs> you know? I make stuff up every single day. You know, if, if a kid is not getting something, just think on the fly. Here, try this instead. Let's do this. It's so flexible, and that's what's great about it. And I really love I'm never going to go back. I can't. I can't go back. Um, I won't. <laughs> uh, so for the next... Oops. Let me back up. Sorry. So for the next five minutes or so, um, cut, like we're kind of in groups already, but try and mix it up a little bit. So like middle school, get with high school, get with elementary, just within your class, within your school, <laughs> bounce ideas off one another to say, okay, uh, in middle school we're doing this right now, what might work? So just kind of bounce ideas around for a few minutes and then we'll kind of bring it back in and tie everything together. <clears throat> so, okay. Um, just, just to wrap it up, some closing thoughts. Uh, pros and cons. So pros, there's, very, there's high retention rates. So things I did first semester are still sticking in their heads. And that was something that I fought last year. Especially kids, I don't know why, but they go home and they come back after Christmas and say, I threw my notes away. It's like, why would you throw your notes away? It's dumb. Man, it's dumb. I don't care. Um, test performance is higher, so kids who typically struggle with exams, because they have multiple takes and they can go back and fix mistakes, test, you know, test grades do go up just by nature of the class. Um, Higher student course evaluations, this is something that was great. At the semester break, I gave an evaluation to kids like, this is great. I hate science, I hate, you know, biology, I hate math, but I like your class. And that, make, <laughs> that makes me feel good, you know, because they're learning. They're learning, and they enjoy it, you know. It's great. Um, and student confidence. So kids who normally are very timid in class are very outspoken now, and I've seen a lot of behavior switch. Um, or, I'll ask a, or I'll ask a teacher, I'll be like, is, you know, is this person a problem, like talking too much or doing this? They're like, no, they're silent in my class. And so they, I, think, I think it switches. <laughs> I think it switches because this is a, a comfortable place for them and they feel secure here. You know? And talking about, um, what was it, like Masterson's needs or whatever his, his name was. It's one of those you know, education philosophy people. But... <laughs> Meeting the needs of the students, they don't feel marginalized by the, by the smart kids. 
they don't feel like they're being held back by the dumb kids. You know, like there's, mm-hmm. it's, it's so open um, that it's really affecting everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, the cons, I work a ton on this, uh, but again, that's the first year. Uh, administrative difficulties, tracking the student progress. This is really difficult for me still, and it's just because I'm not a nitpicky keep data person, and I've really had to teach myself to carry this around, and when a kid shows me something, I have to check it off there. And so they, I tell them not to come up and ask me to do it. They have to bring it to me and watch me do it. Um, so that's something that you have to switch your thinking into. And then not every school is as open to, to this. You know, it's sometimes it's a fight against administration, but because of our administration, um, Mr. Parrish has really been supportive. Dr. Beeson's really been supportive. Um, it's, it's been very easy for me to make this transition, but that's not always the case. Um, so if you want some more resources, there's this thing called the Teacher Broadcasting Network, which is a Ning, which is like a private Facebook. Um, so you, you sign up for this. Uh, and you can join it. There's like 350 teachers on this now. Started this fall with, I don't know, 80. Um, so this is really a snowball right now. And it's Ning, or I'm sorry, Vodcasting, V-O-D-C-A-S-T-I-N-G. This word, Vodcasting, dot Ning, N-I-N-G, dot com. And it's open. And, um, you do need to make a login and everything. You do get your profile page and groups and friends and all that. But... This is great because there are discussions on here that answer beginning beginner questions, really. And there are then discussions that answer, okay, now that I've done this with my class, what can I do further? And so there's a lot of sharing of information. A lot of teachers post their links, post their videos, post their worksheets. So you don't even have to create everything from scratch. I chose to do that this year. You don't have to, though. Um, and then there's a conference in Colorado, if you're going to be in the States this, this June 2011, I can send you a link to that, but it's by the guys who really started to garner the national attention in the States. His name's Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sams. Uh, there's also a book coming out that they wrote called uh, Master Learning in the Reverse Classroom. Um, it's going to be coming out this spring sometime. They're, they sent in the first draft last week. Um, but there are a lot of resources out there. Anytime you want to come into my class, no problem. Melinda came last week. It was crazy, but she got in and she, I mean, she hopped right and started talking to kids. It's like, you can never, you, I mean, coming into another class, you're pulling them away from instruction if you do that, right? But under this, you can come hang out, have coffee, you know, talk with kids, do whatever. So, other questions? All right, thanks. That's, That's it. Right. Yeah.